Hey everybody, welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. Today we're going to be in the second of three lessons that cover the Psalms. These Psalms that we're covering today are going to be Psalms 49 through 86. So if you're just now joining us and you didn't listen to the stuff that we did in our last podcast where we talked about what's going on in the Psalms and how are they being used and when were they written and what's the purpose, you might want to go back and listen to that one because we're assuming that you've already heard all that stuff. So Bryce and I are not going to repeat ourselves. But we'll do a very, very quick summary. We believe, as do scholars around this planet that the setting of the Psalms is a temple ordinance, a temple festival. Now, when we go into the temple, it's an individual ordinance, but in ancient Israel, it was more like a collaborative group festival celebration in the temple. It was their group temple ceremony. And the setting of that is where we believe these psalms come from. So they're very temple-oriented, they're very plan of salvation-oriented, they're ritualistic, they're music-oriented. Imagine a group play, so to speak, reverently held in the temple where there was singing and praises and music and ordinances. Hugh Nibley talks a lot about this, where he says, all music and all drama of all the ages in all cultures come from the temple. And as I've studied other cultures and other New Year festivals, I see so many common themes. So many of the, we're all like checking the boxes and they're in all these cultures. And we see echoes of this today. So scholars that are not of our faith have come to the conclusion that the Psalms were written in a temple ceremony setting. And now we have Latter-day Saint scholars who have the lens of the Book of Mormon and they have the modern day endowment and they're saying, wait a minute, we could put these back in order. The order has been scrambled. What we find in the book of Psalms has been scrambled and we can put them back in order so that it lays out very similar to our modern day endowment. And among it all, you're just going to find some wonderful little one-liners that vibrate that tuning fork inside you. And that's why I personally love the Psalms, as I love to just highlight those verses that just sing. And so we'll point out some of those that mean something to our souls, but we're also going to point out some of the doctrine that you would find in the setting of an ordinance like the temple. And so with that, why don't we just jump into it? Why don't we just start with the 49th Psalm? And big picture, I think the 49th Psalm, a lot of it is talking about resurrection. Now, I know it doesn't say resurrection, and I know there's a lot of arguments against the idea that the Old Testament speaks of the resurrection, but just take a look at at what is going on in this psalm. Verse 3 of Psalm 49, my mouth shall speak of wisdom. And then skip over to verse 14, like sheep, they are laid in the grave, death shall feed on them, and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. Now that word power in the Hebrew is also the word for hand. And so there are some really provocative translations of verse 15 that I think have a little bit more depth, especially in a temple setting. So I'm going to read another person's translation. This is Robert Alter's translation of verse 15, and it reads as follows. And from the grip of Sheol, he will take me. So imagine in your your mind, God grabbing you by the hand and pulling you out of death. Another translation, this is Berlin and Brettler's, it, it goes like this, but God will redeem my life from the clutches of Sheol, for he will take me. And I really like that, especially as we think about the temple and how these things are associated with resurrection and coming back to the Savior. And so once again, translation matters. And I think that Reading the Psalms with the lens of the Temple and the Book of Mormon really helps. We don't read anything like this in the Old Testament. Psalm 49 is teaching this idea, but boy, when you read the Book of Mormon, it really pops. Look at um, Alma 11, verse 42. This is Amulek speaking regarding the resurrection, and he says, There is a death which is called a temporal death, and the death of Christ shall loose the bands of this temporal death, that all shall be raised from this temporal death, and I might add, from the dust. 
The spirit and the body shall be reunited again in its perfect form. Both limb and joint shall be restored to its proper frame, even as we are now at this time. And we shall brought to stand before God, knowing even as we know now, and have a bright recollection of all our guilt. The next verse says that this restoration shall come to all. And so when I read Psalm 49, where it talks about God redeeming me from the grip of the grave or the grip of Sheol, I see Alma 11. When I read verse 17 of Psalm 49, when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. In other words, you're never going to see a hearse going to the cemetery towing a U-Haul. You're not going to see that. Why? Because the stuff stays here. But the underlying message is verse 15, that God's going to redeem me. I wonder if this is the source of that subliminal message that comes from Abraham. Now, it's not in our current scriptures. There's an apocryphal book of scripture called the book of Jasher. And in chapter 11 of the book of Jasher, Abraham, remember how Abraham's father was a worshiper of false gods. So Abraham goes in, and there's this room of the gods, this this area that had all of the different false gods in it. Abraham goes in with a hatchet, and he slaughters all of the minor gods, and then he puts the hatchet in the hand of the major god. And when his father Terah comes in and says, what happened? Abraham basically said, hey, it was that big god. He just, he couldn't stand them, so he took them out. And (laughs) Terah turns around and says, he can't do that. He's just a stone. And Abraham said, exactly, Father. He's just a stone. Why are you worshiping just a stone? In other words, he can't do what you claim these gods do. And I think that kind of set that stage of, are you worshiping the God that really can help you in the end? Are you banking on the right source? And that's what Psalm 49 is trying to say, is if you put your trust in the wrong things— When things really matter, like on resurrection morning, they won't be able to do anything for you. They're like the stone gods that Terah was worshiping. He knew that that god couldn't destroy the other gods. And so there's going to come a moment, if you have worshiped the wrong Messiah, if money has been your Messiah, or if popularity has been your Messiah, or all the false gods that we're warned against— When it really matters, like on Judgment Day or on Resurrection Morning, they won't be able to do anything for you. That's kind of the message of verse 6 and 7. That's the exact message of 6 and 7 is, where will your gods be on Resurrection Morning? And if you have worshipped the right God, then you will receive His wonderful blessings. Now, There is a phrase that I would have you chain in the Scriptures. In Zenos' allegory of the olive tree in Jacob chapter 5, in the end, the bad fruit is sent to its own place. In Doctrine and Covenants section 88, hell and outer darkness are kind of referred to as its own place. In Acts chapter 1, when Judas Iscariot committed a suicide, he went to his own place. And the idea that the Scriptures are trying to portray is, if you have lived your life your way, then that will be your reward, whatever reward you can make for yourself. But if you have worshipped God and done things His way, then you get to enjoy His glory. Now, I know everyone's going to be resurrected. I don't mean to suggest that. But the point is, all of the false gods that we are worshiping in between now and then are not going to be there on Judgment Day to reward us for having worshiped them. But Jehovah will be there. Jesus will be there. Heavenly Father will be there. So I think that's the spirit of Psalm 49, is make sure that you're worshiping the right source so that when it really, really matters, they'll be there. I think Psalm 50 can be read in conjunction with this because the front bit of Psalm 50 is talking about God coming. So just go to verse 2 of Psalm 50. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. There's an overarching theme in the Psalms that 
God will come and establish order and peace. And the context of a lot of these Psalms is the Thanksgiving feast where the crops are brought in and the prayer is to God that the people and the king and queen will keep the commands of God so that we can have this place where there's food for everyone, the poor and the needy are taken care of, and all of this is in hopes that one day God will come. And so I see this in line with resurrection theology. Yeah, and I love verse 5, gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. So before I come, gather the church of Jesus Christ of latter-day saints to prepare the world for my coming. Every time we read that, I just can't help but throw in a promise from the Doctrine and Covenants. Anytime we talk about gathering saints, we have to remember section 29, verse 8. And it is a promise given early in the Restoration that if we come to Zion, if we gather to that place, we will be prepared, our hearts will be prepared, and, quote, be prepared in all things— against the day when tribulation and desolation are sent forth upon the wicked. So as we gather in preparation for his coming, we will be prepared in all things. Now, that doesn't mean that anyone who gathers to Zion will be freed from all harm in the latter days, but we will be prepared. You don't need to be afraid of the second coming. We will be prepared in all things. And so Psalm 50 is, he's coming, let's get ready, and let's be grateful that he's coming. The last bit, verses 16 through 23, is some counsel to the wicked. And to me, I think these verses remind us of the discussion that Alma and Amulek have regarding the wicked in Alma 14. With that, we're going to go to the 51st Psalm, and this is a prayer asking for forgiveness, asking for a new heart and pleading unto God according to his, his chesed, or his bounteous love, his everlasting love. And I think this is a beautiful passage about repentance and about how God can work in the lives of people that feel guilt. Yes. Psalm 51, for me, is the bread and butter of this week's Come Follow Me. As a father, this is the one I'm going to gather my family and talk about. As a teacher, this is where I pause and spend a great deal of my time. And the reason for that is, I would suggest that repentance is one of the most misunderstood doctrines in the kingdom. And we've turned repentance into so many things, and we've lost sight of what repentance really is. In 1988, Theodore M. Burton, as a general authority, wrote this in The Enzyme. He wrote, as a general authority, I have prepared information for the first presidency to use in considering applications to readmit repentant transgressors into the church and to restore priesthood and temple blessings. So in other words, he's the one that prepares the documents for the first presidency to consider when someone's coming back into the church after being excommunicated. So he knows the evidence that people are putting down that someone has repented. Now listen to him continue. He says, many times a bishop will write, I feel he has suffered enough. And then he writes, but suffering is not repentance. Suffering comes from a lack of complete repentance. A stake president will write, quote, I feel he has been punished enough, end quote. Elder Burton writes, but punishment is not repentance. Punishment follows disobedience and precedes repentance. A husband will write, quote, my wife has confessed everything, end quote. And then Elder Burton, but confession is not repentance. Let me say that one very clearly again. Confession is not repentance. Confession is an admission of guilt that occurs as repentance begins. A wife will write, quote, my husband is filled with remorse, end quote. And then Elder Burton, but remorse is not repentance. And then this powerful declaration, he says, suffering, punishment, confession, remorse, and sorrow may sometimes accompany repentance, but they are not repentance. And I have watched so many times in this church, we turn repentance into a list of five R's that you've got to complete for every sin that you commit, and that we send these 
what could be misunderstood concepts about what repentance is. And so here in Psalm chapter 51, we get a beautiful picture. Now, let me point out an interesting phenomenon that I find in the Book of Mormon. I could quote numerous verses of the Book of Mormon where it says, faith is blank. It comes right out and says, faith is. But can you think of one place in the Book of Mormon where it declares what repentance is? From Nephi to Mormon and Moroni, can you think of a single sermon where a prophet declares a definition of repentance? It's not there. But from beginning to end, the Book of Mormon illustrates repentance. It shows what repentance is. And here's the beauty of the Book of Mormon. It's not always the same thing. They don't all do the same thing. They don't follow a set prescription of what repentance is. And so we are left to pull out of these illustrations and ask ourselves, what is the very heart and soul of repentance? Now, we are going to go to what I think is a declaration of a definition. I think this is the very best declaration of, of a definition of what repentance is. And then you're going to see that the Book of Mormon illustrates it beautifully in so many ways. And then I'm going to go to David's illustration in Psalm 51. So I'm going to jump to the New Testament. If ever there was a repentance prophet, John the Baptist is kind of known as the repentance prophet. Even when he came to Joseph Smith, he declared the doctrine of repentance. If you want to follow along, I'm going to read from Mar or Luke chapter 3. It's a beautiful definition of repentance, but you're going to need the Joseph Smith translation. So in Luke chapter 3, I'm going to start in verse 3, and he came into all the country round about Jordan preaching the baptism of repentance. No, there it is. John the Baptist taught the baptism of repentance. And then he says in verse 4, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Now, I think most people read verse 4 and think that's a prophecy of John the Baptist, but they've not made the connection to the previous verse, that John came teaching repentance, and repentance is to prepare the way of the Lord while you're in the wilderness to make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. In other words, repentance is getting Jesus into your life. Sin pushes him out. That's why I love what King Benjamin said in Mosiah chapter 2. He says that when we do sin, we do withdraw ourselves from the Holy Spirit. Sin pushes me away from God. Repentance isn't some ritual that we go through. It's not a Hail Mary prayer. It's not pagan penitence. It's not even an offering that suddenly fixes everything. By the way, that actually came from the Reformation. Metanoia was translated as to do penance, which is what you're talking about, doing a ritual. And later translator says, we're not doing due penance with metanoia. We're going to call it repentance because they were on to this very thing you're talking about. Yeah. Repentance isn't the ritual I go through that says, I'm sorry, please forgive me. It's the relationship I get back into my life. John the Baptist is quoting Isaiah as saying, when you sin, prepare the way to get him back in your life. Now look at that next verse, every valley shall be filled. So one of the reasons Jesus isn't in my life is I've created a valley. Well, I need to fill that valley. If I fill the valley, he will come back into my life. Maybe it's a mountain I've put between me and the Savior. And if I tear that mountain down, if I bring the mountain low, he'll come back in my life. What John is teaching here, what Isaiah is teaching here is, Repentance is reaching out and reconnecting with the Savior and replenishing that relationship. If anything, those are the R's of repentance. It's to replenish the relationship I have with the Savior. 
So this is where we need to pull up the JST. You'll notice footnote 4A is a link to the JST. Would you open that beautiful edition by Joseph Smith? In verse 4, it says, prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Now listen to what Joseph Smith adds. In verse 5, for behold and lo, he shall come. That's the goal, is to get him into my life. Now notice the verbs over the next several verses. If I get him back into my life, he will take away sin. He will bring salvation. He will gather me when I'm lost, when I'm dispersed. He will prepare the way. And then here's my favorite one. He will make possible. If I get Jesus back into my life, he will prepare the way and make possible. If I get Jesus back into my life, verse 7, he will be a light when I sit in darkness. He will do all those things. And so repentance isn't to go through some penitence process or a ritual or to burn incense or to put an offering on an altar. Or in our modern day, my children learned early that to get out of time out, you had to say you were sorry and be really apologetic. One time I watched my son on his way to time out for doing something, knowing that lesson, he, oh, I'm so sorry, mom, and act all penitent. And because we've come to believe that it's that penitent process that is repentance, and it's not. It's getting the relationship right. It's fixing the relationship that I have damaged with God. I love how C.S. Lewis teaches this in a letter he wrote to a friend. You can find this in Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer, and we'll put it in the show notes as well. But he says, repentance can be on very different levels. At the lowest, what you might call pagan penitence, there is simply the attempt to placate a supposedly angry power. Quote, I'm sorry, I won't do it again, let me off this time, end quote. That, C.S. Lewis calls, is the lowest level of repentance. And some members of the church never get past that level. It's simply the pagan penitence. It's the go through the steps of repentance. And then C.S. Lewis continues, at the highest level. The attempt is rather to restore an infinitely valued and vulnerable personal relationship, which has been shattered by an act of your own. If forgiveness in this crude sense of remission of penalty comes in, this is valued chiefly as a symptom or a seal or even a byproduct of the reconciliation. In other words, I don't need God to say, Bryce, you're forgiven, as much as I need God to say, I'm here again. I'm back with you. You separated us for a while, Bryce, but you have now pulled me back in, and I'm here. That's repentance. Now, go read Psalm 51. It is one of the most beautiful illustrations of someone wanting the relationship back. Not someone saying, what do I have to do to be forgiven? It's someone saying, I need you back in my life. Let me read a couple verses. Verse 1 of Psalm 51, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Now notice it's going to get deeper. Purge me, verse 7. I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Boy, I love that phrase. I need you back in my life, Lord, because I am broken and my brokenness hurts me. If you come back into my life, the bones which thou hast broken will rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. 
Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Now, verse 11, watch how this is the pinnacle. Cast me not away from thy presence. If I could circle a phrase in the scriptures that I believe defines repentance, it's that one right there. It's the plea of a righteous, repentant person who says, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. That's my prayer. That's my hourly prayer. It's not just something I do when we commit major sins and I have to go see a bishop. It's something I do every day of my life. Lord, I need thee in my life. Oh, I need thee. Cast me not away from thy presence, even though I've given you so many reasons to do so. Don't leave me. Come back to me and bring back the Holy Spirit. Verse 12, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, meaning I pushed it away and I need it restored. Restored unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Now that we've pointed out that doctrine, you can see all of these Book of Mormon prophets and people pleading with God for the relationship. Can I just give you a handful? Can we just point out a couple? Here's the father of Lamoni, and this is a beautiful plea. This is just like Psalm 51. Oh, God, Aaron hath told me that there is a God. And if there is a God, and if thou art God, Wilt thou make thyself known unto me, and I will give away all my sins to know thee. And you find that all throughout the Book of Mormon. That's how the Book of Mormon illustrates repentance, is it's the pleading of a sinner for the relationship to be restored, not what are the steps I have to go through to be forgiven. Now, let me balance that. Because I don't want anyone to say, well, as long as I feel like I'm okay with God, I can go out and violate some of the standards of the church. Because there's another aspect of repentance that I feel like I need to address to make sure no one goes astray. And that is, I want to be a member of the church, his church. And his church has standards. And if I fall below those standards, either I can't come into that church or I need to repent so that I can bring the church back into my life. Do you see that similarity but difference? So one standard of repentance is I need to get Jesus back in my life. The other standard of repentance is I have violated the standards of the church and I need to get the church back in my life. I need to be in good standing with a church. And that's why we talk about confession to a bishop. The bishop oversees whether or not my membership in the church is in good standing. So I don't want anyone thinking that as long as you feel like you're good with Christ, that you can go out and violate laws of chastity or violate the word of wisdom and be in good standing in the church, because we still have to maintain our membership in the church. And that means I've got to bring the church back in my life when I've made mistakes. And if that requires a bishop, I would encourage you to talk to your bishop and say, here's what I've done. Here's how I feel about it. Can I please have the church and full membership back into my life? But for most of the things that we deal with on a day-to-day basis, it's a matter of getting Christ into my life. That's the heart and soul of repentance. I want Jesus in my life. And I also want membership in his church in my life. And that's why I love Psalm 51. I would gather my children around me this week and teach them the truths of repentance. That's good. In the Come Follow Me curriculum, Psalms 52 to 60 are skipped. A lot of these psalms are individual pleas for help. And so a lot of these things, a lot of these ideas are covered by the other Psalms that we're covering. And so in Come Follow Me, we're skipping those and we're going to go to the 61st Psalm. So we just finished 51 and now we're going to Psalm 61. And there are some scholars that look at Psalm 61 and they see this as a plea that the king gives to God before he goes out to battle. We see also a similarity between 61 and 62. 
there's this overarching idea of being sheltered in the Lord, who is the rock of salvation. So we have verse 2 of Psalm 61, where the individual is crying out, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. And then we also see in Psalm 62, 1 and 2, truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. Skip down to verse 6 of Psalm 62. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. And we read it again in 7. God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. The idea of not being moved can be connected to the king coming into the presence of God, standing upon the rock. We're going to talk about the coronation of the king later when we get to the 72nd Psalm. But just know that the kings would be anointed and they would be crowned, they would be coronated on a rock. And the idea of the king not being moved, there's something that you can trust in the cosmos, and it's the cosmic king who has been anointed by God. But remember, when the king and queen during the Feast of Tabernacles temple drama would make the covenants with God, the king and queen represented us. And so for those of you that are Latter-day Saints that have been to the temple, I always like to teach it simply and say, the king and queen are the witness couple. Adam and Eve are the king and queen of the earth. The Lord even says, I make you, Adam, Lord over the whole earth. Well, we can deduce from this, if Adam is the Lord over the whole earth, then obviously Eve is the queen of the whole earth, and all things are subject unto them. And so this idea of the king being anointed, trusting in God, being upon the rock, these Psalms 61 and 62 could be prayers that the king gives before he goes to battle. Now, skip down to verse 9. Surely men of low degree are vanity, and men of high degree are a lie. To be laid in the balance, they are altogether lighter than vanity." Another translation of this verse, certainly vapor are the sons of Adam. You see, Havel is going to be translated as vanity in Ecclesiastes. That word can mean a lot of things. It can mean vapor or something that's just only breath. And so another translation goes something like this, only breath, humankind, the sons of man are a lie. On the scales altogether, they weigh less than a breath. I think what the psalmist is trying to say is, compared to God, we are just hevel. We're just vanity. The the word, it doesn't really translate, but the idea is that we're nothing. I think we talked about this in the Moses podcast when after God leaves Moses' presence, Moses comes to himself and says, now I know that man is nothing. He very well could have said, now I know that man is hevel. But he's not saying that man is nothing. He's just saying in compared to God. And so I think when we read it that way, we can kind of see the relationship that these verses have with God. And then finally in verse 12, and this is a really important teaching, verse 12 says, Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy, for thou renderest to every man according to his work. That's an important teaching that is sometimes lost in Christianity. Because of its emphasis on grace and salvation on grace and its de-emphasis of what we do, I think sometimes the pendulum goes too far in some Christian circles. And I think what Psalm 62, 12 is trying to say is that God, who is this rock, is going to render unto every man or to repay every man according to his work. And that is a teaching that is found in the scriptures. So with that in mind, the importance of the rock is clearly given in these two Psalms. And not only that, but if you pick up that theme and go to the Book of Mormon and let the Lord expound on that, what does it mean to be built upon his rock? What does that mean? Just search for that phrase, my rock. So the first one takes us back to 1 Nephi chapter 13, that Nephi sees the, a book in the early American colonists, and what's the book? And they have this conversation about the Bible mi- missing plain and precious things, and that the Lord's plan was to restore those plain and precious things by speaking to the Nephites. And notice verse 35, I will manifest myself unto thy seed. They shall write these things which I shall minister unto them. They shall be plain and precious. And then verse 35, speaking about what the Nephites wrote in their plates, in them shall be written my gospel, saith the Lord, and my rock, and my salvation. So the Book of Mormon makes a very clear reference to itself as containing his rock. 
The Book of Mormon is his rock. To build on his rock means I live according to the teachings of the Book of Mormon. Now, the next time that shows up is in Nephi's psalm, which is 2 Nephi chapter 4. If you go to the very last verse, verse 35, he says, Therefore I will lift up my voice unto thee, yea, I will cry unto thee, my God, the rock of my righteousness. I love that, that the rock is the deeds of the Savior. To build upon the Savior's rock is that my righteousness is built upon his righteousness. Do you remember the song, the wise man built his house upon a rock? Sometimes we don't realize the phrase that comes right before that. Before he talks about the wise man building his house upon the rock, he gives this verse. Go to 3 Nephi chapter 14, which is the Book of Mormon's version of the Sermon on the Mount. Verse 24, therefore, whoso heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them... Him will I liken unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock. We forget that phrase, that building upon his rock is hearing his sayings and doing them. Now, it's interesting that he told Nephi that in the Book of Mormon would be found his gospel and his rock. Yeah. Also, this rock, if we're thinking about this liturgically, you know, where are we in this setting? The rock is in the Holy of Holies. This is where God stands. And so his voice, Nephi's voice, ascends past the veil into God's presence. If I'm building my house upon the rock, God's standing on the rock and he's saying to me, Mike, your seed shall be forever. Why? Because your house is upon the rock. Now, how do we get our house upon the rock? That leads me to Third Nephi chapter 18. If you're again searching for that exact phrase in the Book of Mormon, my rock, you're going to be taken to chapter 18 of 3 Nephi. And he's going to say it in verse 13. But whoso among you shall do more or less than these things are not built upon my rock. But we've got to find the antecedent to these things. Notice what comes right before he said that in verse 13. It's when he administers the sacrament. And he says in verse 10, This doth witness unto the Father that ye are willing to do that which I have commanded you. And this shall ye always do to those who repent and are baptized in my name. Ye shall do it in remembrance of my blood, for which I have shed for you, that ye may witness unto the Father that you do always remember me. And if you always remember me, you'll have the Spirit to be with you. And then the very next verse says, I give unto you a commandment that ye shall do these things. And if ye shall always do these things, blessed are ye, for ye are built upon my rock. Now there's one more that I think is very significant. Later into chapter 18, where he says in verse 24, remember, we're talking about doing what Jesus did is building upon the rock. He says in verse 24, hold up your light that it may shine unto the world. Behold, I am the light which ye shall hold up, that which ye have seen me do. And then he's not being generic, do everything that I've done. He points out two things that he did that he's asking us to do. Here they are, starting in verse 24. Behold, you see that I prayed unto the Father. I prayed for each one of you. And then verse 24, ye see that I commanded that none of you should go away but rather have commanded you that you should come unto me, that you may feel and see. And then he picks it up and says, even so shall ye do unto the world. Pray for the world. Pray for the people you love and the people who hate you. Pray for them like Jesus prayed. And then don't ever cast them out. You saw that I didn't kick anyone out even the people that don't believe. Now, I know that we got to hold on to truth. I'm not saying that, but I don't have to kick them out. Jesus says, I never commanded anyone to not come unto me. And you need to do those two things. So I think the Book of Mormon has a very interesting journey if you will look for what is the rock he wants me to build upon. 
and this all ties into Psalms. I mean, oh, we're talking about that. the rock in 61 and 62, but then 63 is a veil type scene where they're coming and seeing. So what you just did was you just laid out how in the teachings right here in the Book of Mormon coincide with what's going on in the psalm. It's pretty cool. That is the beautiful lens that we get to see the psalms in. If the setting of the psalms is kind of a temple setting, it's the Book of Mormon that elaborates it and says, building upon the rock is coming unto God and letting your life be like his. Now, just a promise, as long as we're talking about the rock, we might as well go to Helaman chapter 5. I know you're all thinking it. In verse 12, he says, my sons, remember that it is upon the rock of our Redeemer. And I'm going to elaborate. It's the rock of his words, the rock of his example, the rock of those two specific things that he did in terms of praying for everyone and then never kicking anyone out of his presence, but wanting everyone to come unto him. It is upon the rock of our Redeemer, who is Christ, the Son of God, that you must build your foundation. Now, if you do that, Again, this is a whole lot of psalms being summed up in one verse. If you build on his rock, that when the devil shall send forth his mighty wind, yea, his shafts in the whirlwind, and when all his hail and his mighty storm shall beat upon you, it shall have no power over you to drag you down from the gulf of misery and endless woe, because of the rock upon which you are built, which is a sure foundation, a foundation whereon if men build they cannot fall. So Book of Mormon is being hinted at in these verses, and you may want to take some time and search the connection to what is the Book of Mormon teaching about building upon that rock. Yeah, I really think that everything you just laid out is exactly what's going on in Psalm 61. So, I mean, that is a really good list. We'll put that, the the verses that Bryce kind of laid out, we'll put those in the show notes. This leads us to the 63rd Psalm. I'm going to call it a veil type scene. A type scene is something we see in the Old Testament a lot, and it just means if we see something where we're kind of checking off a certain criteria, we know something's going on. A a classic type scene is if you're reading the Old Testament and you find a man who's a shepherd and he's out in the wilderness and he comes to a well and there's a woman, there's usually in those type scenes, there's usually something involving life fertility. Sometimes it leads to a wedding and sometimes it leads to new beginnings. That's a type scene. Well, what do we see in the 63rd Psalm? We see this individual who says in verse one, O God, thou art my God. Early I will seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. This idea of thirsting can remind us of the Beatitudes where we read that, quote, all they who do hunger and thirst after righteousness are they that shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. And so in the ancient temple, hungering and thirsting after righteousness ultimately focused on the coronation ordinances of sonship. As the Holy Ghost comforts and teaches and cleanses us, it sanctifies us and empowers us to transcend the problems of the world, the sorrows of the world. And the Holy Ghost gives us power to be restored, to be brought back into God's presence. And so what do we read here in the text? Verse 2 says, To see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. So it's, it's like these prophets that are brought into the council, like Lehi or Isaiah in Isaiah 6, where he says, I've seen the, the Lord of hosts. And so because of this, we read verse 3, Because of thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Notice also, Mike, that it's that, back to the Book of Mormon idea of of how the Book of Mormon presents this, my soul thirsteth for thee. How many times in the Book of Mormon does it talk about being filled? Jesus, if you go back to the Book of Mormon, where he administers the sacrament, notice in chapter 18, verse 4, when they had eaten and were filled. Verse 5, when the multitude had eaten and were filled. Verse 9, so it came to pass that they did so and did drink of it and were filled. And they gave unto the multitude and they did drink and they were filled. Now go to chapter 20 and he adds a little bit to that phrase. Notice in verse 8, he that eateth this bread eateth my body to his soul and he that drinketh of this wine drinketh of my blood to his soul and his soul shall never hunger nor thirst 
but shall be filled. Now, hold on. Keep going. Verse 9. Now, when the multitude had all eaten and drunk, behold, they were filled with the Spirit. You see how that goes right back to Psalm 63. So build upon my rock through covenanting to live like Jesus lived, and you will be filled with the Holy Ghost. That's why at the end of our sacrament prayers, it says that if we obey the covenant, if we commit to do what Jesus did, it says that the Holy Ghost shall always be with us. We'll be filled. And so not only do you need to find that word rock in the Book of Mormon, but find this idea of being hungry and then satisfied. Every time we talk about the fruit of the tree of life, they're filled and they don't hunger. It's right there. And in the third Nephi account, Jesus is feeding them. Notice verse 5, my soul shall be satisfied with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. So we have this feasting taking place. In verse 4, we have the individual who is seeing God lifting up their hands. We read, I will lift up my hands in thy name. Now, the phrase for marrow and fatness can be translated a couple different ways. It can be translated as literally with suet and fat. Another way to, to translate this would be simply the richest part of the beast, uh, the deshen or the fatness. In other words, it's an abundance of food, this super abundance. And this was part of the temple drama in the fall festival where they would feast. And so what do we have here? We have the individual coming to the rock with uplifted hands, seeing God in the sanctuary, hungering and thirsting, praising God. And then we get to verse 7. Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. What does that mean, in the shadow of thy wings? In the temple's holy of holies, on either side of the throne were great golden cherubim. Their wings touched the sides of the walls and made a kind of canopy that stretched over the throne. Over whoever sat upon that throne and over the Ark of the Covenant, that person now sat in front of the throne as its footstool. The phrase that God dwelleth between the cherubims, that's Psalm 80 verse 1 and Isaiah 37 16, and that God sitteth between the cherubims, that's Psalm 99 1, these are references to God sitting on his heavenly throne or in the earthly temple. And so because the throne and its overshadowing wings were symbolic of the reality and power of priesthood and kingship, they were symbolic of the invitation to receive the gift of eternal life. And so just think about this. How many times did the Savior talk about coming under the wings to represent his invitation to come unto him? A classic example would be in the Gospels, where the Savior said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often I would have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and yet you would not. We read that in Matthew twenty three thirty seven. It's also in Luke thirteen thirty four. But we also read that Nephi says, quote, upon the wings of his spirit has my body been carried away upon an exceedingly high mountain, and my eyes have beheld great things, yea, even too great for man. Therefore I was bidden that I should not write them. That's 2 Nephi 4.25. And so we have this idea that God is pulling this individual close to him, and he is, or she, is in the shadow of the wings of God. Now, the wings can also be translated as, as an embrace, as being brought into God's presence. Back in 61, Mike, verse 4, it talks about the covert of his wings. I will trust in the covert of thy wing. And I think a synonym for covert is the safety of his wings. That is the embrace, right? I'm making you safe. I'm covering you. Yeah. Now, if we read this with Malachi 4, there could be a divine mother there. We talked about this over a year ago. So if you want to know more, go back to the podcast that we did on Doctrine and Covenants section 2. But to be brief in speaking on this, because we put a lot of work into the show notes so that you can get into the grammatical situation with what's going on with Malachi 4. In verse 1, we read about the day coming that shall burn as an oven, and the Lord of hosts will come. But then you read verse 2, and it says, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. 
and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Now, that's this promise that those who come into God will be in the shadow of his wings. And that's what it says in the King James. But just know that in the Hebrew text of this verse, it literally says that the son of righteousness will arise with healing in her wings. It's all feminine all the way through. Now, this is just me. This is just the gospel according to Mike Day. This is just my opinion. But what if it's both? What if that image, as it's portrayed in Malachi 4, is the divine mother arising with healing in her wings, and part of coming to God is also participating in a divine embrace of the father and the mother and the son. You see, in ancient Israelite tradition, there was El, which was God, the father, and then there was a heavenly mother, and that there was also Yahweh, which was the son. And that was really in the earliest roots of Israelite tradition. That's how they viewed God. So there's a couple great books by a scholar by the name of Mark Smith, and he wrote one called The Origins of Biblical Monotheism. He wrote another one called Where the Gods Are. Great books. And he gets into the weeds in this quite extensively, that in early Israelite tradition, pre-monarchy, that was the idea, that there was a heavenly father, that there was a heavenly mother character and a divine son. And I, I happen to like this idea. And so I like reading Malachi 4.2 in the Hebrew and to show this is a, a, the divine feminine that's happening here. Now, that's just me. That's just me nerding out. But back to the psalm. So go back to Psalm 63 after we've left Malachi 4 and notice what it says. In the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. That's verse 7. But notice verse 8. Thy right hand upholdeth me. And then, verse 11, the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone that sweareth by him shall glory. So there's this idea in in these verses that God takes the king by the right hand into his presence. If we read this with Malachi 4, there could be a divine mother there. And then we kind of skip this, but if you look in verse 10 of Psalm 63 and at the end of verse 11, there seems to be an indication that the enemies of the king are not going to be there, that they're going to be outsiders, as it were. They're not going to participate in this. And all these ideas were swirling around at the time of the monarchy, and there's a lot of scholars that say this was ritually portrayed in front of the house of Israel so that they could see how they could ascend into God's presence. So it's a liturgical drama that's happening, and the text of Psalm 63 is showing us this final scene of the king coming into the presence of God. Okay, so with that, let's go to Psalm 64. Psalm 64 is a prayer for help. There's quite a few of these in the Psalms. Some other ones are Psalm 69, Psalm 71, Psalm 74, and the front bit of Psalm 77. Okay, so if you go to Psalm 64, verse 2 is a prayer that the individual says, hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked. And verse 3 says, they wet their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows. And verse 5 says, they commune of laying snares privily. Now back to the theme of Bryce showing us how this is in the Book of Mormon. Can you think of a time in the Book of Mormon when the bad guys are getting together and they want to kill the good guys? And that's actually portrayed in the Book of Mormon because this was part of the drama, that there was a conflict between forces of light and darkness. But the beauty is, verse 7, God shall shoot at them with an arrow. And we actually see this in the Book of Mormon where the bad guys get taken out right before the Savior comes. So there's some interesting things. But you see the juxtaposition in the Book of Mormon? The bad guys shooting their arrows couldn't hit the good guy. Yeah. But God will hit them with his arrows. It's just kind of a fun little foil. <laughs> By the way, I, I love that picture, the Freeberg picture of Samuel the Lamanite. And I don't know who did this, but whoever did, I'm a fan. Somebody replaced the, the people shooting at Samuel the Lamanite with stormtroopers. And I'm as a Star Wars nerd, I just can't. That's his classic because stormtroopers can't hit anything. So if you're the person who did that, I just took my hat off and tipped it to you. Okay, um, Psalm 65. The 65th Psalm is the Thanksgiving Psalm of the Harvest Feast. And so to these ancient people who their very livelihood depended upon, are we going to have rain? Are we going to have, you know, they didn't have irrigation pipes per se and pumps that brought the water to the land. They had to depend on the, on the rain. This Psalm, like many others, was sung at the time when they brought in the harvest to praise God. Now, the premortal work of Jehovah and the other members of the council in heaven, 
Their work was the creation of the heavens and the earth. It was important that the account of the creation be told and retold every year in the temple. Why? Because to the ancients, it told them who God is. God is Jehovah, the God of salvation and creation. This is the God that brought the rain. And so the psalms sung during the performance of this drama affirmed that Jehovah had created the world. They demonstrated to them that he is the light of the sun, for it is he who controls the elements, the storms, establishing everything that everything is or was. By definition, it is God, God of gods, Lord of lords, and King of kings. So go to Psalm 65 and just skip down to verse 6. By his strength setteth fast the mountains. This is God who set fast the mountains. Being girded with power, which stilleth the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the people. They also that dwell in the uttermost parts are afraid at thy tokens. Thou makest the outgoings of the morning and the evening to rejoice. Thou visitest the earth and waterest it. Skip down to verse 10. Thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly. Thou settlest the furrows thereof, thou makest it soft with showers. Skip down to verse 13. The pastures are clothed with flocks, the valleys are covered with corn. They shout for joy, they also sing. Now, before we get into this, I just want to talk about verse 8 with that word tokens. That can be kind of confusing to some people. The word ot can mean tokens, it can mean signs, it can mean wonders, it can mean a lot of different things, but the idea is that it denotes proofs or miracles or signs, and so the King James translators went with tokens. Another translator, Sigmund Mowinkle, translated it this way, "...who by his might raise up mountains, being girded with power, who stilled the roaring of the sea, the tumults of its waves, so that the dwellers at the ends of the earth were terrified by thy wonders." And so I I like that translation. I think it's beautiful. The overarching principle here is that we have fertility. Why? Because we brought in the harvest and we're asking God to give it to us again. I was thinking about this on the way driving here to record for the podcast. I thought, we have these big cities in the world. And some people don't even know where food comes from. It's a fun conversation to get into with your kids where you're like, okay, we're eating this meal. Where did this come from? And if you've ever heard the phrase flyover states, you know, there's these states that are kind of between the coasts of America. We have the East Coast with the big cities and the West Coast with the big cities. And then we have all these states in the middle that people fly over and don't pay attention to. And yet, would we even have big cities if we didn't have Nebraska or Oklahoma or Kansas? In other words... We have cities today because we have people that grow food. Large farms. Right. And so that feed America. (laughs) If you're one of those farmers out there and you're listening to this, this is me taking my hat off and tipping it to you and saying, thank you. Uh, Obviously, we live in a different world, but the people that wrote these Psalms that lived at this time period, everything was tied to the land. And so they're making a joyful noise, singing to God and saying, thank you for the rain. And can we please have some more next year? I mean, that really is this beautiful Psalm thanking him for what he has done for them. Now think about this. If you're in America, what do we do every fall? We have a holiday and we call it Thanksgiving. And then what do we do? (laughs) We, We eat, right? We eat a lot of food and some people watch the lions lose. Sorry if you're from Detroit. I I, I, I couldn't help myself. (laughs) Mike, I think it's funny that probably one of the most common held traditions that we all have is we pray before we eat. Now, it's become a tradition of blessing it, which I think is erroneous. I don't think the prayer needs a blessing, but we need to thank Him. I, I, I would submit to you that one of the center traditions of most religious people is to pray before we eat. And I think it falls out of this idea that we recognize the greatness of God in this food that we are partaking, and we're praying for more. And so all of you who have a hand in producing that food, I think we just tip our hands to you. to all of you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, 66... The 66th Psalm is one of these Psalms which shows us that the sacred temple drama was participatory. 
And so what do we have here? In the garden scenes where we're talking about the creation, the king and queen played the roles of Adam and Eve, who were the first royal couple to come and preside over the earth. This is one scholar, his name is Benson. He says, quote, the king then is primeval man. The first man of Genesis 1 is described as the first ruler of the world. In the first creation story, the gospel of the new year, we hear the blessings spoken by God at the enthronement of the first royal couple who came into the world. Why? Because man is to, quote, rule over all living creatures. And so the king and queen represented Adam and Eve. Now, they were simultaneously both the first royal couple and the present reigning king and queen. So they were the king and queen, but they also represented Adam and Eve. But they also represented us. If we were there watching this, they represented us. In some ancient cultures, the king was considered to be a god, but not in Israel. The Israelite king was Jehovah's representative on earth, and in Psalm 2 and Psalm 110, he's going to be called, quote, a son of God. That's an important thing that we'll get into when we get into Psalm 110. We also talked about it with Psalm number 2. There were other actors on the stage, and the members of the audience participated by following the lead of the king and queen, either symbolically or ritually. And that's kind of what we see going on with Psalm 66. We see it in other places as well. We're going to see this in the 33rd Psalm. We'll see a bit of this in Psalm 68, where we read that the singers went before, the players on instruments that followed after, and among them the damsels playing with timbrels. We see this in Psalm 81, verse 1 through 4, where it says, Make a joyful noise, blow the trumpet on the solemn feast day. We see it in Psalm 149, where it says, Let them praise his name in the dance. And we see it in Psalm 144, verse 9, where it says, I will sing a new song unto thee. And Bryce has talked about the new song that the saints will sing when God comes again. And I think, I don't know, but I think that that song was sung in the original temple. And as I've studied other cultures and other New Year festivals, I see so many common themes. And we see echoes of this today. So what do we see in Psalm 66? We see members participating in in the drama. So what do we see? Look in verse 1. Make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands. Go to verse 2. Sing forth the honor of his name. Skip to verse 4. All the earth shall worship thee. Now, Mike, I think we can push that even further. Not only was it part of that temple drama, but it's going to be part of the earth's drama when Jesus comes again. Joseph wrote these words in section 128. Look how well they correspond to Psalm 66. He said, let the earth break forth into singing. So first the earth starts. And then he says, let the dead spring forth anthems of eternal praise to King Emmanuel who hath ordained before the world was that which would enable us to redeem them out of their prisons, for the prisoners shall go for free. Someday the dead will join in that drama, and all the dead will sing praises to God. Then in verse 23, he continues, let the mountains shout for joy. Let all the valleys cry aloud and all the seas and the dry lands tell the wonder of your eternal king. And ye rivers and brooks and rills flow down with gladness. Let the woods and all the trees of the field praise the Lord. And ye solid rocks weep for joy. Let the sun, moon, and the morning stars sing together. And let all the sons of God shout for joy. Can you imagine how it's going to be when he comes again and we play this out again in a very real setting, but the earth and every saved corner of this planet will sing out praises to the God. That should happen every single time we in our hearts think about what he did for us. We should sing forth those praises today. That's what's going on in Psalm 66. It's participatory. Now... This week's curriculum is skipping 67 and 68, and it's going right to 69. Before we go on to the next part, I just want to pay homage to 68 because I think there's a lot going on here, and so I'm going to be brief. I know this isn't part of the lesson for Come Follow Me, but I want to look at some things in the 68th Psalm. In the section heading, it's called a Messianic Psalm of David, verse 5. What kind of person is God? A father of the fatherless and a judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. That's who God is. He loves widows and the fatherless. 
Now, we're reading how the earth shook in verse 8 and how God moved through the wilderness and Sinai was moved. And we talked a lot about this back when we did Genesis 6. So if you go back to our Genesis 6 podcast at the 1832 mark, we talked quite a bit about this. But I just want to once again reference this. This section of Psalm 68 is the conflict between the enemies of truth and righteousness. And big picture is there's two mountains. One is Mount Sinai, and that's the headquarters for Jehovah. And the other is Mount Bashan, where the forces of darkness are. And the big picture of Psalm 68 is the good guys are going to win. That Bashan's going to be taken over and everything's going to work out. And a big part of this is also what we talked about in the previous bit in Psalm 66, where it's participatory. In the context of this drama, go to verse 25. The singers went before, the players on instruments followed after, and among them were the damsels playing with timbrels. There were women involved in the festival, and they had parts, and they danced, and they sang. And what did they sing? They sang that God won. Go to verse 31. Princes are going to come out of Egypt. Verse 32. Sing unto God, ye kingdoms of the earth. O oh, sing praises unto the Lord. Why? Because the good guys win. And this was a big part of their understanding of the cosmos and their understanding of the temple is that God was actually participating in history. The ancient Israelites believed that this was a God who knew them and played a role in their life. They didn't have this deist view that God just kind of wound up the universe like an alarm clock and set it on the shelf and then went golfing. No, their view was that God was very much in their lives, but they also acknowledged that there were forces of darkness that fought against the forces of light. So that's big picture Psalm 68. I love it. 69 is a beautiful look into the wrestle we're going to have in mortality. And, And there's the balance that God is going to save you but you will sink in the deep mire. You will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And so there's that balance between God is going to bless you and help you, but we're here to be tested and to exercise our agency. And so somewhere in the middle of that is the Lord is not going to save you from every mire, from every hole that you're going to fall into, but when you fall into the holes, he is going to pull you out. And so there's that balance of mortality. And 69 is kind of that wrestle. I really like verse 2, I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. But I know, verse 14, Deliver me out of the mire and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me and out of the deep waters. And so I am swimming in deep waters and I need to, and it's going to make me strong. And I'm going to row as long as I possibly can. But I know that in the end, he will pull me out and deliver me out of those mires. So 69 is kind of that wrestle in mortality about the things I'm going to struggle with and the help I'm going to receive from heaven. You know, Bryce, I really see 69, 70, and 71 all kind of having that theme of like, save me, help me. And in that sense, we're like Jesus, verse 21 of verse 69, they gave me also gall for my meat And in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. That's clear reference you and I see to Jesus. And in that sense that the Messiah had to drink vinegar and eat gall. And so will we, but we will be rescued from it. Eventually, he will say, it is finished, and all of his pain ended. I really like that, Bryce, and I also like that the people that put the footnotes together give you the references to the gospel writers. It's interesting that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of them, in some way, are quoting that psalm. And so to the gospel writers, Psalm 69, they saw the application to the Savior. I do want to mention a verse that kind of may be somewhat confusing. So go to Psalm 70, make haste, O God, to deliver me. That's verse 1. But then skip down to verse 3. Let them be turned back for a reward of their shame that say, aha, aha. That can be kind of weird. Like, what does that mean? Aha, aha can be translated as imitating a cry of joy over an enemy's misfortune. 
So I don't know how we would say it today. Maybe we would laugh if someone tripped or we'd say, ha ha, maybe ha ha would be better. So Robert Alter translates this as, quote, let them turn back on the heels of their shame who say, hurrah, hurrah. So th- there's his translation. Maybe I would say, ha ha. But wh- however you're going to read verse three, it reads a little clunky. But the overarching message of these Psalms, at least as I see them, are a prayer for deliverance to be delivered out of the hands of the unrighteous people or the unrighteous cruel man and to not be cast off. In other words, a prayer that God will remember the individual who is offering the prayer. Now, Psalm 72 is a coronation. There are three coronations, we think, in the uh, temple drama or coronation-like ceremonies that were performed during the course of the Feast of Tabernacles temple drama. The first coronation was at the Council of Heaven. That was in Psalm 45, where the king received a blessing from Elohim in which he was given all the powers and authorities that were required for him to do his job on the earth. The second coronation is on earth when the young person or the heir apparent was anointed to become king. Notice this is David praying for Solomon. Do you see that transition and becoming king and being anointed as king? And that's very symbolic where one king is praying for the ascension of another king. Yes, exactly. And and by the way, they would be anointed to become king, and then when they took the throne, that would be the third coronation where they would receive that anointing. This third coronation of the king established him as the king, and it was performed and subsequently reenacted on the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles temple drama when he was adopted as a son of God, that's Psalm 2, and sat upon the throne of God in the Holy of Holies. And so... There was a moment in the ritual in the Old Testament where you were appointed to become such, and then there was another moment where you were actually appointed as such. Now, that should ring true to a lot of you listening. That, that actually happened in a lot of European countries. They would have the anointing to become the monarch, but then they would receive the anointing when they took the throne. We actually link this in the show notes. We actually send you to a video from 1953 when Queen Elizabeth was anointed to be queen. We give you a couple different references, a couple different videos if you want to watch those. The one where she's anointed, they actually edit that. You'll have to watch it really closely. I think it's like a 16-minute clip. But it's fascinating, Bryce, that the Queen of England was washed and anointed, and she received this orb. At one point, she holds an orb, which represents the idea that she's to take all the spiritual blessings of Christianity to the whole world. There's another part of the coronation ceremony where they hand her a sword in one hand, and she's holding a scepter. I actually have a student who went to England and looked at all these articles of kingship, and he told me just the other day, he said, Brother Day, there's actually four swords that she holds a sword, and then they give her a different sword. And every sword represents a different aspect of kingship, and it's all tied into this idea of bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world, ruling with equity and truth, being a just person. All that stuff is tied up into the 72nd Psalm, this coronation. I like how you point out that it's Solomon who is to be the next king here. So it even says it right there, verse 1. Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. Why? Verse 2. He shall judge thy people with righteousness and thy poor with judgment. He will, verse 4, judge the poor, save the children of the needy, and break the pieces of the oppressor. He will, verse 8, have dominion. And his enemies, verse 9, shall lick the dust. I like that phrase. Verse 12, he'll deliver the needy. Verse 13, he'll spare the poor. I love 16. There shall be a handful of corn in the earth. In other words, the earth will be fertile. And verse 17, his name shall endure forever. Now, here's the thing. If I was watching this anciently, remember, the promises given to the king are given to you. Which is just like the promise of the oath and covenant of the Melchizedek priesthood, that if we receive his priesthood, if we receive his leaders, we receive him, and if we receive him, we receive all that he has. I really like this, how one author says these coronation rites are in basically all the ancient cultures. They're in Egypt and Mesopotamia. They're even in medieval Europe. And then he says, 
Isaiah 61 contains all five of the most essential elements of any coronation. And here they are. The five things are, one, the individual is washed, then clothed, then anointed, then given a new name, and then crowned. And that's happening here in Isaiah 61. That's happening also in Psalm 72. And that happened with Queen Elizabeth. And so just let those ideas swirl in your mind as you ponder the meaning, the deep meaning of Psalm 72. And what modern day temple attendees should understand about the ordinance today and its purpose thereof. Yeah. Psalm 72 is just dripping with temple imagery and kingship and what it means to become a son and daughter of Christ. Psalm 74, as a total Old Testament nerd, is one of my favorites. I love it. And it's all about the conflict with the dragon and God's defeating the dragon of the sea. So this is Psalm 74, 12 through 18. It's also Psalm 89, 10, where where a God breaks Rahab in pieces. And it's this idea, and all the ancient cultures have this, is that in the divine council, there's a conflict. One character takes on the role of dragon, and they have to like do conflict with the dragon, and out of it comes creation. Out of it comes light. And a lot of the ancient cultures do this, whether you read Hesiod or what, you know, whatever you're reading, whether you read Marduk or the Baal cycle or, or the Old Testament, they're all kind of talking about this idea. And it shouldn't really trouble us because as Latter-day Saints, we know about, we call it the war in heaven. I mean, it's in Revelation. So it's in this stuff. I just wanted to at least reference it. You know, we can't do everything because, you know, we, the podcast would be nine hours long, but I just wanted to make reference to it. So now with that in mind, let's go to Psalm 77. Now, 77 and 78 to me go together, and they represent Moses and the Exodus and establishing legitimacy and kingship. We're tying everything back to Moses because remember, Adam was the first king, but Moses kind of sat in that position. Why? Moses, remember, Exodus 24, met God, had the feast, and was ordained to kind of lead Israel through the chaos. So this whole festival drama centered on that concept of legitimacy, and the legitimacy of the kingdom was a couple things, priesthood and kingship. And it was the priesthood of Jehovah and him being the king of the universe that made it so there was legitimacy, and the king became what was known as a sacral king or a sacred king who participated in this drama and got some of the power from God to represent God to the people. And one of the first people in the Bible to do this that we have in the text. Now, you and I, those of you listening that are LDS, we have the Pearl of Great Price, which tells us Adam was doing this. But if all you have is the Bible, like we don't have Adam doing this, but who do we have doing this, acting as this sacred king? Well, it would be Moses, who was on the golden throne. Moses received the rights and powers of priesthood from the Lord on Mount Sinai at first, and then at the time when Moses was caught up to an exceedingly high mountain, he saw God face to face, and he talked with him. And the glory of God was upon Moses, and then Moses could endure his presence. And so go to verse 20 of Psalm 77, thou lettest thy people like a flock by the hand of Moses. Go to Psalm 78, skip down to verse 12, where it says, Marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt. Verse 13, he divided the sea and caused them to pass through. And one thing I want to point out, while it's speaking about the significance of Moses, of all the things to draw attention to regarding what Moses did, it's the need to teach these things to your children. That gets emphasized here in the psalm. Psalm 78, verse 4, we will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. And then in verse 6, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which shall be born. Verse 7, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and a rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. Now go back to Deuteronomy 6. Moses said clearly to the house of Israel, verse 6, these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. 
You've got to teach your children. Now, notice the influence that must have had on Nephi, because how many times does Nephi say things like 2 Nephi 25, 26? And we talk of Christ, we rejoice in Christ, we preach of Christ, we prophesy of Christ, and we write according to our prophecies. Why? That our children may know to what source they may look for a remission of their sins. Those Old Testament ideas must have really, really sunk deep in the heart of Nephi because he's frequently pointing out that we did this for our children. We did this to teach our children. And by the way, Bryce, I mean, that really is the importance of religion, because if we don't teach our children, the Book of Mormon shows us what happens if that doesn't happen, yep. right? Way back in Second Nephi 4, what we call Nephi's psalm begins with these words, and upon these I write the things of my soul, and many of the scriptures which are engraved upon the plates of brass. For my soul delighteth in the scriptures, and my heart pondereth them, and writeth them for the learning and the profit of of my children. So of all the things to point out regarding Moses, I think it's fascinating that we point out that command to teach your children. I like that. So the Exodus story really is retold in Psalm 78, 12 through 58, and then there's a shift in the 59th verse. When God heard this, he was wroth and greatly abhorred Israel, so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh. So what's going on? The shift goes from Exodus to the loss of the tabernacle at Shiloh. Now, if you remember, we talked about this back in the period of the Judges, back in 1 Samuel 1, and this is referring to Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, and then the eventual loss of the tabernacle at Shiloh. So the author of the Psalms, this, this kind of gives us an idea of when this Psalm was written, because all this stuff's in the rearview mirror. The Exodus has already happened, the loss of the tabernacle at Shiloh, and that's kind of what's going on with verse 63 and 64. It can kind of be confusing, but we think that these verses are talking about the sons of Eli and how they kind of messed up there. So with that, we're going to leave Psalm 78. This week's curriculum is skipping Psalm 82. But once again, I can't help myself. We have to talk about Psalm 82. We have to. Now, let me just preface everything by saying Psalm 82, it's really short, eight verses. It could be its own hour and a half podcast very easily. Just simply to quote the people who quoted Psalm 82, like Paul, and modernly to read the writings of C.S. Lewis, this psalm really did give voice to an incredible idea that some people picked up on, that we Latter-day Saints, it's kind of become our second nature, but here it is in the Scriptures. Yes, Bryce. I mean, Jesus himself even quotes Psalm 82. If you go to John 10, Jesus is quoting this when people come to him and accuse him of being guilty of proclaiming to be the Son of God. He actually uses and invokes Psalm 82 in his defense. And so I'm just going to read the whole psalm. It's short. So here it is, Psalm 82. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and the needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, and all of ye are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. Now, we link this in the show notes because there's a lot going on here. There's a 65-page document by Daniel C. Peterson. He goes through and gets into the weeds on this. But one of the first things that he gets into when he analyzes this is this question, who is being addressed? So what do we have here in verse 1? We have God standing in the congregation of these divine beings. We have him saying in verse 6, you are gods, and you are children of the Most High. So the question is, is he addressing mortals? Is he addressing divine beings? That's the question. And what we think is going on in verse 1 is that God is standing among the noble and great ones, and that these are human beings who are pre-earth spirits. They are the same race of God. They are gods in the sense that they are the same race, and God sees the future. He knows what they're to be. But they will also die like men. 
God is speaking to them, and then he's telling them, verse 3, that they are to defend the poor and the fatherless, and they are to deliver the poor and the needy. And then verse 8, arise, O God, and judge the earth. I think verse 8 is God telling his son, Jesus, that he, Jehovah, is to rise up and take the position as the preeminent judge among all the divine beings in the pre-earth council. Suffice it to say, those of you that have been to the temple know that the creation took place and that God, God the Father, stood among many noble and great ones. We have all throughout the Old Testament, especially in the older tradition, first person plural pronouns being used to describe God. We have it in the very beginning. Go to Genesis 3, verse 22, where it says, The Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. So we clearly have plural divine beings here. And the way I read verse 2 is we have the Father and we have the Lord God, that Adam has become as one of us. We have it again in Genesis 11 with the story of the tower. Let us go down and there confound their language. This is plural, gods, Genesis 11, 7. So what do we have here in the congregation of the gods or the, of the Elohim? What we have here in Psalm 82 are multiple divine beings, and what they're saying is they're saying to the council that the divine beings or the Elohim are to defend the poor and the fatherless. I see this, I think really it's a lot easier to read this if we use the book of Abraham as a lens. And what do we read in the book of Abraham? We read the story of these multiple divine beings. We read the story of how the preeminent being among all the divine beings is the Lord God. And the Lord God is the greatest of all these intelligences. And part of the plan is to prove them if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them to do. And one of the things that the council is commanded to do is to defend the poor and the fatherless. But they will die like men. That's verse 7. It can be very confusing if we read Psalm 82 with our modern lenses, especially if we read it with a monotheistic lens. All this stuff about plural divine beings all throughout the Old Testament really throws curveballs at a lot of Christians because they're like, what is this? This is coming way out of left field. But if we take off our, our modern lenses and we read the text as the way the ancients read it, they believed that there were multiple gods. And when I say that, I'm, that can be kind of confusing. So one way to, to say this is that they believed that there was a council of gods and that Jehovah was preeminent among them. And however you want to read the Elohim, these, these gods, as it were, I'm reading it as follows. We have a father, we have a son, Yahweh, we have a divine mother, and we have other divine beings. It's a council but they will die like men. And so the way I read it is that these are pre-earth spirits that will one day be exalted. Now, this is laying the foundation. I mean, understanding who the Father is, understanding that there was a plan, understanding that we were told before we ever came here, this is going to be a world of sorrow and grief, and there's going to be poor and needy. And if I'm going to follow Jesus... I better do something. I better not just sit on the sidelines. I've got to go do something. And so to me, Psalm 82, I put a a star on it. And in the liturgical setting of the festival drama, I put this at the front end. This is way before the creation. This would be like Psalm 1 or one of the very first ones. Right. And that kind of leads us to Psalm 85. Did they know about us? Did their temple drama have a reference to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Because something is said in 85 that I know that modern scholars are going to look at it and they're going to miss it, but because we have the writings of Enoch, because we have the Pearl of Great Price and some very clear things that Enoch was taught, we can't help but notice a reference in 85 to the Restoration. And it even made it, I think, because of Bruce R. McConkie, into the chapter heading. So it makes you wonder what in this temple drama in the Old Testament was said about us. Knowing what the Lord said to Joseph of Egypt about a Latter-day Joseph, knowing what was said to Isaiah about a sealed book, knowing the numerous references throughout the Scriptures, could it be that their very temple ceremony had a reference to the story of the Latter-day Saints coming before the end. 
and restoring all things. Because notice in 85, out of this very simple setting about hearing God, that I will hear the Lord, I love verse 10, mercy and truth are met together, righteousness and peace have kissed each other, and then boom, out of the blue, in verse 11, this phrase that we've heard before, truth shall spring forth out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. That is very much a reference to Moses chapter 7, to what the Lord says to Enoch about the latter days, starting in verse 60, as I live, even so will I come in the last days, in the days of wickedness and vengeance, to fulfill the oath which I have made unto you concerning the children of Noah. In verse 61, he says, I'm going to preserve my people. Now, how is he going to preserve his people? Verse 62 righteousness will I send down out of heaven, and truth will I send forth out of the earth to bear testimony of mine only begotten. I know that could be applied in many, many ways, but that has to be seen in light of the Book of Mormon coming forth out of the earth. That truth, first vision, Moroni, visits of angels, priesthood and restoration— Righteousness will I send down out of heaven, and truth will I send forth out of the earth to bear testimony of mine only begotten. That's the chief purpose of the Book of Mormon, his resurrection from the dead. Now notice the combination of that. What came down from heaven restored keys, and what came out of the earth restored truth, and righteousness and truth will I cause to sweep the earth as with a flood, to gather out mine elect from the four quarters of the earth. Unto a place which I shall prepare, an holy city, that my people may gird up their loins and be looking forth for the time of my coming. For there shall be my tabernacle, and it shall be called Zion, a new Jerusalem. Did that truth make it into their temple ceremony? Was our story of the restoration part of first temple Israelite worship? You know, just reading it while you're reading Moses 7, I just got to say Moses 7 is more plain. It's, uh, in the words of Joseph Smith, it's a more plainer translation. And that now brings us to the last of this week's Come Follow Me, and that is 86. And we go back to my main emphasis this week of Psalm 51 and the story of repentance. It's David again begging for forgiveness. Now, I know that section 132, verse 39 makes a suggestion that David has fallen from his exaltation and that he will not inherit them out of the world. I don't know what that means. I can't wait to get a full explanation from Joseph Smith of section 132, verse 39, because Psalm 89 says in verse 13, thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Now, I don't know how we combine those two thoughts. But David, in his plea for the relationship to come back, says in verse 13, Thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. And it seems to be in verse 16 at the setting of Bathsheba's child not dying. He seems to be pleading for the life of that child that came about because of his sin, but ultimately died. So verse 16 seems to be the setting following his transgression and before the death of Bathsheba's child. So I don't know exactly how to wrestle with 132, but I love David as a symbol of how to repent. And I love the promise in verse 13 that David's repentance got him out of hell. Now, what that means, I'll wait someday and the Lord can teach me and explain it to me. But what I do know is that the greatest hell I've been in is the loss of his presence when I transgress. That repentance needs to be seeking for the restoration of the relationship not simply to placate an angry God and go through the steps I need to, but it's to get him back in my life. When King Lamoni wakes up from his trance, he looks his wife in the eye and says, Blessed be the name of God, and blessed art thou, for as surely as thou livest, I have seen my Redeemer. 
he had come back into Lamoni's life. What's funny is Ammon, when he saw that Lamoni was passed out, knew that the dark veil of unbelief was being cast away from his mind. And the light which did light up his mind, which was the light of the glory of God, which was a marvelous light of his goodness, yea, the light had infused such joy into his soul, the cloud of darkness having been dispelled, and that the light of everlasting life was lit up in his soul. That's what we want back, the light of everlasting life. And when that comes back, like Alma, we will sing the song of redeeming love. That's got to be the purpose of our repentance and the purpose of our temple covenants is to get God back into my life and let the light of redeeming life light up our soul. So with that, we are going to end this podcast. We will see you next week when we cover the last third of the Psalms. We will be covering selections from Psalm 102 to 150. Make it a great week. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions.